picture an object so unimaginably dense, with gravity so overwhelming that even light, the fastest thing in the universe, gets trapped, unable to escape its immense pull. This is the world of black holes, where space gets warped beyond recognition. Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that when enough matter is squeezed into a small enough space, a black hole forms, and its boundary is called the event horizon. Once you cross it, there's no coming back. The bigger the black hole, the more matter you need to compress, but even something as massive as our sun would need to shrink down to just three kilometers to reach that point. At that size, its density would be off the charts far beyond what we see anywhere else in the universe today. And for anything less massive than the sun, it's held together by the invisible forces between subatomic particles, preventing it from collapsing into a black hole. Now, not all stars will end up as black holes. Our sun, for example, won't collapse into one. But stars that are more than 10 times the mass of the sun are likely to go that route. In fact, our own galaxy is estimated to contain over a billion stellar black holes, though most are invisible, except for those locked in binary systems where we can detect their effects. Then we have intermediate mass black holes, which could form from stars more than 100 times the mass of the Sun. These massive stars can collapse during oxygen burning stages, potentially leaving behind remnants that could even be linked to gamma ray bursts. Beyond that, there are supermassive black holes, giants with masses ranging from millions to billions of times that of the sun. These monsters are thought to reside in the center of galaxies, including our own, where a four million solar mass black hole lurks. Quasars, those incredibly bright beacons in the distant universe are powered by supermassive black holes, some as massive as 100 million suns. All of these black holes, from stellar to supermassive, are considered macroscopic because they're larger than a kilometer in radius. They behave according to the rules of classical physics, meaning quantum effects can be mostly ignored. But there's another fascinating type of black hole, the primordial black hole. These are believed to have formed in the extreme conditions of the early universe, just milliseconds after the Big Bang. These could be much smaller than stellar black holes due to the incredibly high density of the universe back then. Primordial black holes that formed slightly later could still be considered macroscopic, for instance. Those created a second after the Big Bang could have masses comparable to supermassive black holes. On the smaller end, primordial black holes with masses less than that of the moon could be microscopic, potentially only the size of a micron, but they might still have significant astrophysical effects, possibly even providing a clue to the mystery of dark matter. If a black hole's mass drops below a certain threshold, around 10 to the power of 12 kilograms, which can be equated to the mass of a mountain, its size shrinks to less than that of a proton. At this point, things get really strange. In 1974, Stephen Hawking discovered that black holes don't just consume matter, they also emit radiation. The smaller the black hole, the hotter it gets. For a black hole with the mass of a mountain, the temperature would be so intense, around 10 to the power of 12 Kelvin, that it would radiate particles like photons, electrons, and positrons. As a black hole emits energy, it loses mass and becomes unstable. The smaller it gets, the hotter it becomes, emitting more energetic particles and shrinking even faster. When its mass drops to around 1 million kilograms, the process ends in a massive explosion releasing the energy of a million megaton nuclear bomb in just one second. The time it takes for a black hole to completely evaporate depends on its initial mass. For a black hole the size of our sun, this would take an incredibly long time, 
about 10 to the power of 64 years. But for a black hole with a mass of 10 to the power of 12 kilograms, it would take roughly 10 billion years, about the age of the universe. So, primordial black holes of this size would be evaporating right now, while smaller ones would have vanished much earlier. We refer to these smaller black holes, under 10 to the power of 12 kilograms, as quantum black holes, because quantum effects play a significant role in their behavior. Hawking's work was a major breakthrough because it brought together three important areas of physics, general relativity, quantum theory, and thermodynamics. However, it was just the first step toward a complete quantum theory of gravity. His analysis, like all classical physics, starts to break down when the density of matter reaches an extremely high level, called the Planck density, about 10 to the power of 97 kilograms per cubic meter. At this point, gravity becomes so strong that quantum effects on space-time need to be considered. To fully understand the formation and evaporation of Planck-scale quantum black holes, a theory of quantum gravity is necessary. Such a theory might even suggest that tiny, stable remnants, known as Planck mass relics, could remain after a black hole evaporates. More recently, another intriguing possibility has been proposed, the existence of extra dimensions, which could play a crucial role as a black hole shrinks to the Planck scale. These extra dimensions could dramatically change our understanding of gravity at extremely small distances, potentially offering new insights into how quantum gravity works. The concept of extra dimensions add back to the 1920s, when Kaluza and Klein proposed that a fifth dimension could unify gravity and electromagnetism, as long as it is compact or wrapped up very small. Later, Scientists discovered more subatomic forces, and theories like superstring theory introduced six extra dimensions, while M-theory, which unifies different versions of string theory, suggests there are seven extra dimensions. Normally, these extra dimensions are thought to be so small that on the Planck scale, they have no noticeable effect on black holes larger than the Planck mass. However, in some models, these dimensions might be larger, which would cause gravity to grow much stronger at short distances, deviating from the usual Newtonian inverse square law. Some models even propose warped extra dimensions, but they would still have the same effect of making gravity much stronger at tiny scales. When an evaporating black hole shrinks to the Planck scale, around 10 to the power minus 35 meters in size, and 10 to the power minus 8 kilograms in mass, it becomes what we call a Planckian quantum black hole. It's much smaller than an elementary particle, but far more massive. This is likely the smallest possible black hole since below the Planck length, space itself can't be treated as continuous. It's also possible that many primordial black holes formed during the Planck era due to quantum fluctuations but they would have evaporated very quickly. The idea that gravity could grow stronger at small scales suggests that the standard estimate for the Planck energy, and therefore the minimum mass needed to form a black hole, might be too high. This raises the exciting possibility that black holes could potentially be created in particle accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider. These machines accelerate particles like protons to nearly the speed of light giving them extremely high kinetic energies. At the LHC, for example, a proton reaches an energy of around 7 tera electron volts, equivalent to a mass of 10 to the power of minus 25 kilograms. When two particles collide at such high speeds, their energy is concentrated in a tiny space, which leads to the question, could these collisions occasionally create a black hole? In the absence of large extra dimensions, this is unlikely. A proton's mass, which is 10 to the power of minus 25 kilograms, is far smaller than the Planck mass, which is about 10 to the power of minus 8 kilograms. 
quantum mechanics shows that even at LHC energies, the proton's energy is spread out over a distance of about 10 to the power of minus 19 meters, the smallest region into which the proton's energy can be packed, resulting in a density of 10 to the power of 30 kilograms per cubic meter, well below the Planck density required to create a black hole. Under the standard model, a proton would need to be accelerated to the Planck energy 10 to the power of 19 giga electron volts to form a black hole, which is beyond the reach of the LHC by a factor of 10 to the power of 15. However, if large extra dimensions exist, the Planck scale would be lower, meaning that the energy required to create black holes could be within the LHC's range. In this case, the black holes would be as small as elementary particles and would evaporate almost immediately, causing a burst of detectable energy, lighting up the particle detectors like Christmas trees. While there's still no experimental proof for this idea, it opens up the exciting possibility of exploring the quantum gravity scale through black holes. This could provide insights into how space-time is structured and whether there are hidden higher dimensions. To truly understand this, we need to carefully examine how black holes are created in particle collisions, especially in high-energy experiments like those conducted in particle accelerators. A complete theory of quantum gravity is also essential to address a profound paradox highlighted by Hawking's discovery, one that touches on the deep conflict between general relativity and quantum mechanics. According to relativity, any information that falls into a black hole is lost forever. But if the black hole eventually evaporates, it raises the question, what happens to the information? Hawking suggested that black holes could evaporate entirely, destroying the information inside, which contradicts the principles of quantum mechanics. Several solutions have been proposed, including the idea that black holes might leave behind stable remnants that preserve the information. In this video, we're diving into the mysterious quantum world of black holes. Black holes can form from the collapse of massive stars that have finished burning their nuclear fuel. Stars smaller than about four times the mass of the Sun become white dwarfs as their collapse is stopped by electron pressure. Stars between four and eight times the mass of the Sun might explode due to carbon ignition. For stars larger than eight times the mass of the Sun, they burn until an iron-slash-nickel core forms at which point nuclear reactions can no longer produce energy and the core collapses. If this collapse is halted by neutron pressure, a neutron star forms and the outer layers are ejected in a supernova. For even larger stars, around 25 to 40 times the sun's mass, the collapse might be delayed due to fallback of ejected material, but eventually the core collapses into a black hole. If the star is above 40 times the sun's mass, it collapses directly into a black hole. These stellar black holes likely exist throughout the disks of spiral galaxies. Stars larger than about 102 times the mass of the sun are unstable during their hydrogen and helium burning phases due to radiation pressure. These stars, called very massive objects, can survive for a few million years because the pulsations they experience during these phases are controlled by shock formation, which reduces mass loss. However, when very massive objects begin burning oxygen, their high core temperature creates electron-positron pairs, leading to instability. If the core is large enough, it collapses into an intermediate mass black hole. This process occurs in stars with masses above 200 times that of the Sun. Some believe that early, massive stars of this kind might be scattered throughout intergalactic space and could even be linked to gamma ray bursts. While once thought to contribute to dark matter, it's unlikely because they would produce too much light. For even larger stars, over 105 times the mass of the Sun, known as supermassive objects, 
the collapse is driven by general relativistic instabilities, skipping nuclear burning altogether and directly forming supermassive black holes. These black holes are often found in the centers of large galaxies, but their exact formation process is still unclear. They could form through the merging of smaller black holes, accretion of material, or relaxation processes in star clusters. Despite their size, SOMs do not undergo the extreme compression seen in stellar black holes, and a black hole with a mass of 109 times the sun's would have a density similar to that of water inside its event horizon. Primordial black holes smaller than the mass of the sun would need extremely high compression to form, but such conditions might have naturally occurred in the early moments of the Big Bang. These types of black holes could have emerged from initial cosmic irregularities or phase transitions during the universe's evolution. Their mass would depend on the size of the particle horizon at the time they formed, leading to a wide mass range from about 10 raised to the negative 5 grams forming at the Planck time to 105 solar masses for those forming around one second after the Big Bang. Some could even fall into the intermediate mass black hole range, potentially contributing to dark matter and generating an interesting gravitational wave background without emitting excessive background light. If evaporating primordial black holes leave behind stable Planck mass relics, these relics could also contribute to dark matter. The first example of a black hole structure, or metric, was discovered by Schwarzschild in 1916, shortly after Einstein introduced general relativity. Although its nature as a black hole wasn't understood for decades, the Schwarzschild metric describes the space around a non-rotating spherically symmetric black hole. It depends on the mass of the black hole and is written using spherical coordinates r, beta, and phi. This solution to Einstein's equations assumes there's no matter around, meaning the energy stress tensor is zero. The Schwarzschild metric behaves like flat space far from the black hole but shows two points where it becomes singular or breaks down at r equals 2m and r equals zero. The singularity at r equals 2m is just a coordinate issue that can be fixed by changing the way we describe the space. But the one at r equals zero is a true singularity where the curvature of space-time becomes infinite. This curvature affects how particles and light move. Light rays travel along paths called light cones, which represent the limit of how fast things can move. In flat space, these cones are at 45 degree angles but near a black hole, they tilt due to the space-time curvature. As you approach the black hole, r equals 2m, known as the Schwarzschild radius or event horizon, the light cones tilt so much that all paths lead into the black hole. Inside this boundary, nothing, not even light, can escape. The no-hair theorem is a principle in astrophysics and general relativity that states that all black holes, regardless of the complex details of how they formed, can be completely described by only three externally observable classical properties, and these are mass, electric charge, and angular momentum. According to this theorem, once these three properties are known, no other distinguishing features, such as the detailed shape, composition, or history of the object that collapsed to form the black hole, remain observable from the outside. In other words, black holes have no hair, meaning they have no other unique or complex external characteristics besides mass, charge, and spin. A black hole's mass affects its temperature. Large black holes behave classically, emitting Hawking radiation and decaying over time. These are semi-classical black holes. In contrast, Quantum black holes near the Planck scale don't emit thermal radiation 
and decay by producing just a few particles. High energy particle collisions could theoretically form black holes through shockwave interactions. Penrose, Eardley, and Giddings demonstrated that, under certain conditions, a closed trapped surface indicating a black hole can appear. This idea also applies to quantum black holes, though fully understanding it requires quantum gravity theories. The production of black holes in such collisions is often described using geometrical models that estimate the likelihood of formation based on energy levels, and similar ideas are applied even in quantum gravity or supersymmetry theories. One of the major breakthroughs in theoretical physics over the past two decades is the idea that the scale of quantum gravity could be much lower than previously thought, possibly around a few tera electron volt, instead of the usual 10 to the power 19 giga electron volts. This shift in thinking comes from models that suggest gravity's strength could be influenced by extra dimensions or hidden particles. In models with large extra dimensions, gravity spreads out over these extra dimensions, while standard particles like those in the standard model, are confined to a familiar three-dimensional space, or brain. By adjusting the size of these extra dimensions, it's possible to make gravity appear much weaker in our world, pushing the effective scale of gravity, the Planck scale, down to the TV range. Different models, like the ADD model, are Connie Hamed, Dimopoulos, and Diwali, and the Randall-Sundrum model, explore how gravity might behave across these extra dimensions. In these models, black holes and other phenomena could form at much lower energy levels than originally thought, opening new possibilities for research and experimentation in particle collisions. However, challenges such as explaining proton decay remain. To further develop this theory, physicists also look at how the Planck scale changes when coupled with various types of fields and particles, with quantum corrections impacting gravity's behavior at high energies. The scale at which quantum gravity effects become significant depends on the number and types of particles present, as well as how they interact with gravity. Some particles lower the energy scale for quantum gravity effects, while others increase it. Understanding these interactions helps refine predictions about when and where quantum gravitational effects might become observable. Instead of trying to directly create tiny black holes at particle colliders to explore quantum gravity, it's useful to consider other methods. One powerful approach is effective field theory, which allows us to study quantum gravity indirectly at lower energies. By integrating out quantum gravitational effects, we are left with an effective action that can help probe the quantum gravity scale. In this approach, the Higgs boson plays a role, as its interaction with space-time curvature affects the Planck scale. There are three key parameters, psi and C1 and C2, that determine these interactions, and they are tied to the behavior of gravity and the universe's expansion. Current experimental limits such as from the Large Hadron Collider and submillimeter tests of Newton's law, place constraints on these parameters, though they are still not strong enough to reveal much about quantum gravity. For example, certain theories like Higgs inflation or Starobinsky inflation involve specific values for these parameters, but current experimental bounds are too weak to test them. To measure these effects, and probe quantum gravity indirectly, creative new methods and experiments will be needed. This approach is valuable since these parameters could, in principle, be calculated from a quantum gravity theory, offering a rare indirect glimpse into this elusive field. Planck suppressed operators can greatly affect grand unified theories. For example, dimension five operators, involving the GUT field and scalar particles can change how the forces of the standard model unify. Some studies show that these operators may make supersymmetry unnecessary for achieving this unification, 
but they can also disrupt it in supersymmetric models. This means that predictions about how forces unify at high energy levels must consider quantum gravitational effects. These operators also impact how fermions, matter particles, interact with scalar fields and grand unified theories, influencing the unification of their interactions. These contributions must be accounted for when discussing unification. In cosmology, quantum gravitational effects, particularly during the early universe's inflation, are important. The universe likely expanded rapidly due to a scalar field called the inflation. Higher dimensional operators, similar to those in grand unified theories, can appear when quantum black holes are considered. While these operators may help solve issues in interpreting cosmic data, they can also disrupt the inflation stability making it harder for inflation to occur. Many models try to use symmetries to avoid these destabilizing effects. Planck-sized black holes may influence low energy measurements due to the large number of possible states they can exist in. Some theories propose that these black holes, acting as remnants, could help solve the black hole information paradox by storing information within their tiny volumes. However, Producing such small black holes directly would require collisions at extremely high energies. Since we haven't probed beyond a few TV in experiments or cosmic ray collisions, it's unlikely that we could produce these black holes unless there are large extra dimensions or hidden particles. Thus, direct production of Planckian quantum black holes is not feasible at current energy levels. The situation changes when considering quantum black holes indirectly through their effects in quantum loops. These virtual black holes, even though they aren't directly observable, could still contribute to particle physics processes. In low energy experiments, the influence of quantum black holes might be limited as heavy particles usually don't affect low energy physics but quantum black holes could be different due to their potentially vast number of states. When we consider a whole spectrum of black holes, their cumulative effects could be significant, potentially impacting low energy observables. In models where black holes are remnants, their large number of quantum states could further amplify these effects, contributing to debates about whether remnants can resolve the black hole information paradox. This challenge also applies to models predicting quantum black holes at lower energy scales, as their vast number of states could disrupt our understanding of low energy physics. The production of black holes in high energy particle collisions provides insight into the possible masses of quantum black holes. The smallest black hole mass is around the Planck scale, and the largest can be 5 to 20 times that. The contribution of quantum black holes to low energy physics depends on two factors, the number of states and their multiplicity. If the spectrum of black holes is continuous, it could lead to an infinite number of states and large contributions to low energy physics, which isn't realistic. However, if the mass spectrum is quantized in units of the Planck scale, the number of quantum black hole states would be limited to a range of 5 to 20, making it manageable. The multiplicity factor depends on whether quantum black holes retain the no-hair property of classical black holes, meaning they would only have a few defining characteristics like mass, angular momentum, and electric charge. If this holds, meaning quantum black holes wouldn't significantly impact low-energy experiments, while quantum black holes could carry additional quantum numbers, for example color charges from particle collisions, the number of states remains small. Even if two black holes store different internal information, they are considered the same from the perspective of an outside observer if they share the same quantum numbers. This limits the multiplicity of states. One of the most precise tests for the effects of new physics like quantum black holes, comes from the measurement of the muon's anomalous magnetic moment. However, if gravity respects certain symmetries, 
Quantum black holes are unlikely to strongly affect low-energy experiments like this one, with new physics contributions limited to a few TV in scale. Quantum black holes can affect the muon's anomalous magnetic moment, but the impact is limited. By using this measurement, we can set a loose upper bound on the number of quantum black hole states, finding that n is less than around 10 to the power 32. This suggests that unless there are infinitely many quantum black hole states, they won't significantly influence low energy physics. If quantum gravity breaks symmetry at a deeper, non-perturbative level, the bound on n tightens slightly to about 10 to the power 11. However, this is still not restrictive enough to rule out the possibility of Planck-sized quantum black holes or remnants. Thus, such remnants remain a plausible solution to the black hole information paradox. Finally, thought experiments involving quantum black holes suggest that combining general relativity and quantum mechanics might introduce a minimal length in nature, which has been explored in various theoretical models. In the 20th century, physicists focused on combining different theories to form a unified understanding of nature. Quantum mechanics, which explains how tiny particles behave, was merged with special relativity, leading to quantum field theory. Similarly, electricity and magnetism were combined into electrodynamics, which was later unified with the weak nuclear force into the electroweak theory. Scientists believe that this electroweak theory and the strong nuclear force could come from a single, deeper theory called the Grand Unified Theory. To take things further, unifying gravity, explained by general relativity, with other forces requires combining it with quantum mechanics, just like quantum mechanics was unified with special relativity earlier. This unification is complex, but by exploring how quantum mechanics and general relativity work together, scientists have found that there may be a minimal length in nature around the Planck scale. This means there is a smallest measurable distance, below which no tool or method can measure. Black holes play a key role in understanding this, as ideas from quantum mechanics, like the uncertainty principle, and general relativity, like black hole collapse, lead to this conclusion. From the hoop, conjecture, and uncertainty principle, the smallest possible size in the universe is thought to be around the Planck length, so small that it's beyond anything we could ever measure or observe with current technology. It's like the smallest unit of space. For a particle with energy E that isn't a black hole, its size is roughly determined by either one by E which is its Compton wavelength, a quantum effect. When we minimize this size, it approaches the Planck length. Even though position might be quantized, broken into fixed steps, momentum can still behave continuously. In quantum mechanics, even if space is divided into a grid with fixed spacing, momentum can still have continuous values, especially over larger volumes. Displacement, change in position over time, also doesn't have to be in fixed steps even though position and momentum are connected. If the particle is a black hole, its radius increases with mass. This means trying to measure distances smaller than the Planck length is impossible because gravity limits us to detecting sizes around 1 by L. While a simplified view suggests that position steps are close to the Planck length, this doesn't necessarily disprove the idea of a minimum length. To challenge that, we'd need to measure positions closer than the Planck scale, and the true mechanism may involve complex ideas like space-time foam or string theory. Many arguments about a minimum length can be simplified by understanding the idea of a minimum ball, the smallest size. Close to the Planck length, however, this doesn't stop us from localizing large objects with great precision. For example, 
We could try to measure the position spectrum of an object by bouncing wave packets off it without worrying about gravity. In theory, this could reveal the discrete nature of position. But to detect these small position steps, we would need probes with wavelengths as tiny as the spacing between the position steps. When these position steps are as small as the Planck length or smaller, gravitational effects come into play, creating black holes or minimal balls. This means that measuring positions more accurately than the Planck length isn't possible as using probes with very short wavelengths would cause. These gravitational effects. Another type of tool, like an interferometer, can measure distances smaller than the size of its parts. But even this device runs into limits set by quantum mechanics and gravity. The uncertainty principle and the possibility of gravitational collapse prevent us from making infinitely precise measurements of position steps. So, no matter the approach, we can't measure positions with accuracy better than the Planck scale. Suppose we measure the position of a free particle twice, once at the start and again after some time. The position at the later time depends on its initial position and momentum. The uncertainty in these position measurements is limited by how long the measurement takes and the mass of the particle. Specifically, one of the position uncertainties must be at least as large as under root t by m, where t is the time and m is the mass. To measure position steps smaller than the Planck length, we could try increasing the mass of the particle. But doing so creates a problem. As mass increases, the measuring device also has to get larger to avoid collapsing into a black hole. There's also a limit where the size of the measuring device can't exceed the time of the measurement. Due to the laws of causality, information can't travel faster than light. When combining these limits, we find that it's impossible to measure position with precision smaller than the Planck length. No device, whether it's an interferometer or another tool, can overcome this limitation. The minimum length we can measure is tied to the Planck length although the exact size could vary slightly. If someone tried to reduce this minimum length, the mass of the apparatus would have to become much larger than its size, creating a black hole before the measurement could even happen. This would trap any signals inside, making it impossible to transmit the result. So trying to measure below the Planck length ultimately leads to gravitational collapse, preventing any meaningful measurement from escaping. One implication of this result is that there might be a limited number of degrees of freedom in any given volume of the universe, meaning space and time may not be truly continuous. Instead, there's a finite amount of information or entropy in any finite region. A major challenge in quantizing gravity is dealing with infinite quantities caused by fluctuations at very small distances. However, these infinities might just be a problem with the way we calculate things using perturbation theory. A minimum length could act as a natural limit, removing these infinities. This idea could be tested through simulations of quantum gravity, like using a lattice model, to see if we get finite results even when we approach continuous space. A minimum length at the Planck scale could indicate that non-local interactions, where effects happen across distances, are involved in the unification of quantum mechanics and general relativity. In this context, researchers have calculated the mass and properties of the smallest black holes. These black holes cause tiny violations of causality, effects that seem to happen outside the usual cause and effect rules at energy levels near the Planck scale. The mass of these black hole precursors depends on the number of fields in the theory. There has been renewed interest in studying how gravitational fields interact, 
and whether certain quantum properties, like perturbative unitarity, the rule that probabilities always add up to one, could break down below the Planck scale. In studies of gravitational scattering, it's been suggested that this unitarity might be violated at certain energy levels, depending on the number of fields in the model. Researchers have found that this issue can be resolved by a process called resumation, where an infinite series of interactions is taken into account. This restores unitarity, the principle that probabilities in quantum mechanics add up to one, but introduces some non-causal effects meaning events can happen outside the normal cause and effect flow. These effects become significant at energies near the Planck scale. So, while unitarity can be saved, it comes at the cost of allowing some non-causal behavior at very high energies. In this context, the resumed graviton propagator shows three poles. One of these poles corresponds to a massless graviton, the particle that carries gravitational force, while the other two are complex poles. These complex poles represent quantum black hole precursors, tiny black holes that are expected to form at energies near the Planck scale. The first complex pole, the first complex pole corresponds to a black hole with a mass of about seven times 10 to the power of 18 giga electron volts and a lifetime tied to its width, which is around 6 times 10 to the power of 18 giga electron volt. These black holes arise due to strong gravitational dynamics at such extreme energy levels, signaling the transition into quantum gravity effects. These quantum black holes can cause a causal effects, events happening out of the usual cause and effect order due to fluctuations in space-time at the Planck scale. Since black holes have an extended structure, these non-local distant effects are expected, and researchers like Wald have shown that this could lead to strange behaviors in the relationships between events at very small distances, such as at the Planck scale. In the case of gravitational interactions, a concept called self-healing suggests that quantum black holes play a key role in maintaining unitarity, ensuring probabilities add up to one in quantum mechanics. As the energy in a system increases, so does the mass of the resulting black hole, which begins to behave more like a classical object. This is known as classicalization. Additionally, there is an expected modification to the uncertainty principle which describes how precisely we can measure position and momentum. As energy increases, the mass of the black hole at the pole of the resumed propagator also increases. This makes the black hole larger, leading to stronger non-local effects, meaning that interactions happen over larger distances. Consequently, increasing the energy in an experiment doesn't allow us to probe smaller distances because the uncertainty in position grows as energy increases. Since calculations become unreliable in the regime where energies exceed the Planck scale, we can't precisely determine how the uncertainty principle changes, though similar studies in String the Story have tried to explore this using the econal approximation. It's important to note that a potential non-minimal coupling between scalar fields and the Ricci scalar does not impact the mass of black hole precursors in the resumed propagator. Even if scalar fields like the Higgs boson are coupled to curvature, as in Higgs inflation models, this coupling doesn't lead to strong dynamics below the Planck scale. This is consistent with previous findings, which show that in the large N limit, the resumed graviton propagator doesn't develop a pole. So, the mass and width of the smallest black holes have been calculated, showing that these values depend on the number of fields in the model. For the standard model, the mass and width of these black holes are near the reduced Planck scale, as expected. Interpreting the poles of the resumed graviton propagator at high energies gives valuable insight into the unification of quantum mechanics and general relativity. Interestingly, non-causal effects, 
where events can occur outside the normal time flow, seem to be a feature of quantum black holes, suggesting that quantum gravity may be made finite by mechanisms like the Lee Wick model. Both the self-healing and classicalization mechanisms seem to be essential components of quantum gravity and a more generalized uncertainty principle. Black holes come in various forms, depending on their mass, charge, and spin. The simplest kind of black hole is known as the Schwarzschild black hole, which has no charge and doesn't spin. But black holes can also have other properties that lead to more exotic behaviors. When a black hole spins, it's called a Kier black hole, and when it carries an electric charge, it's called a Reissner Nordster M black hole. These types of black holes, especially when combined with quantum effects, open up new possibilities in physics. A Kerr black hole spins rapidly, which causes the space around it to twist. This twisting of space is known as frame dragging, and it can have profound effects. For example, matter that falls into a Kerr black hole is not simply pulled straight in. It is pulled into a spiral because of the black hole's spin. The faster the black hole spins, the stronger the frame dragging effect. Near the event horizon, this effect becomes so strong that no object can remain stationary. Everything must move in the direction of the spin. Quantum mechanics adds another layer of complexity to this picture. In quantum theory, particles near the event horizon are subject to quantum fluctuations, which means they can momentarily gain or lose energy. In a rapidly spinning Kier black hole, these quantum fluctuations could affect the black hole's event horizon in unpredictable ways, possibly even allowing particles to escape. A Reissner Nordster M black hole carries an electric charge, which introduces another force into the mix, electromagnetic force. This charge creates an electric field around the black hole. The presence of both gravity and electromagnetism makes the physics of these black holes more complex than uncharged ones. Particles that fall into a Reissner, Nordster M black hole feel both the gravitational pull of the black hole and the electric force from its charge. In quantum terms, charged particles near the black hole could interact with its electric field, leading to more exotic effects, such as the creation of particle-antiparticle pairs. These pairs could affect the energy balance near the event horizon, which might influence how quickly the black hole radiates away its mass through Hawking radiation. Higher dimensional black holes add another layer of intrigue. In string theory and other high energy theories, extra dimensions are often proposed to explain the behavior of particles and forces. In higher dimensional spaces, black holes can take on more exotic forms. For example, a black string is a type of black hole that extends like a line in extra dimensions. Similarly, black brains are two-dimensional surfaces of black holes that exist in these higher dimensions. These higher dimensional black holes can behave differently from their three-dimensional counterparts, particularly when it comes to quantum effects. For instance, the event horizon of a higher dimensional black hole could interact with quantum particles in unusual ways, such as stretching or deforming in response to quantum fluctuations. This could potentially alter the behavior of Hawking radiation or even allow new types of particles to escape the black hole. Black hole analogs, which are physical systems that mimic the behavior of black holes, provide a way to study quantum phenomena associated with black holes in the lab. These analogs are often created using fluids, acoustic waves, or even light, and they can simulate the event horizon of a black hole. For example, certain materials can slow down light to the point that it behaves like it's falling into a black hole. In these systems, 
Researchers have observed effects similar to Hawking radiation, where particles seem to be emitted from the event horizon. These black hole analogs allow scientists to test some of the quantum theories associated with black holes in controlled environments. By studying these systems, we can learn more about how quantum fluctuations affect real black holes, particularly near the event horizon where classical and quantum effects intersect. In a Kerr black hole, quantum tunneling could play a key role in how particles escape. Tunneling is a quantum effect that allows particles to pass through energy barriers that would be impossible to cross according to classical physics. Near the event horizon of a spinning black hole, particles could gain enough energy through frame dragging to tunnel through the horizon and escape. This process is related to Hawking radiation, where particle-antiparticle pairs are created near the event horizon and one particle escapes while the other falls into the black hole. The faster the black hole spins, the more energy is available for particles to tunnel out, potentially increasing the rate of Hawking radiation. Quantum effects can also influence how black holes behave in extreme conditions, such as during collisions with other black holes. When two black holes merge, the resulting black hole is often larger and spins more rapidly than either of the original black holes. Quantum fluctuations during the merger could affect the final state of the black hole, particularly in terms of its spin and mass. These fluctuations might also affect the gravitational waves emitted during the merger. Gravitational waves are ripples in space-time caused by massive objects like black holes. In quantum theory, space-time itself could fluctuate, leading to variations in the gravitational waves that we observe. These fluctuations might offer insights into how quantum mechanics and gravity interact at the most fundamental level. In the early universe, primordial black holes could have formed when quantum fluctuations caused regions of space to collapse under their own gravity. These black holes would have been much smaller than the ones we observe today, but they could still interact with quantum fields. If primordial black holes existed, they could have evaporated through Hawking radiation, potentially leaving behind a trace in the form of high-energy particles. Alternatively, they might still exist today, hidden in the dark matter that makes up most of the universe's mass. The quantum behavior of these tiny black holes could reveal new information about the nature of dark matter and the early universe. In exotic cases, black holes could also have different kinds of event horizons. For instance, some theoretical black holes might have inner and outer horizons. In quantum theory, these multiple horizons could interact with each other in complex ways, affecting the flow of particles and energy in and out of the black hole. For example, in a charged black hole, the inner horizon could act as a boundary where particles are temporarily trapped before being released. This could lead to unusual quantum effects, such as particles bouncing between the two horizons before escaping as radiation. Finally, some theories suggest that quantum gravity could fundamentally change how black holes behave. In classical physics, black holes are defined by their event horizons and singularities, where space-time curvature becomes infinite. But in quantum gravity, these singularities might be replaced by something more manageable, like a loop or a network of quantum connections. This idea is central to theories like loop quantum gravity, which suggests that space-time is made of discrete units or loops. In this view, the center of a black hole might not be a singularity at all, but a highly dense quantum structure. This could eliminate the paradoxes associated with singularities and offer a more complete understanding of black holes at the quantum level. Black holes in higher dimensions could also have strange shapes. For example, a five-dimensional black hole might look like a donut or a ring instead of a sphere. In quantum theory, the event horizon of such a black hole could behave very differently from a spherical black hole, 
potentially leading to new kinds of radiation or particle behavior. These higher dimensional black holes could also give us clues about the fundamental nature of space and time, especially if our universe has hidden dimensions that we can't directly observe. In 1974, a revolutionary idea was proposed by Stephen Hawking, which forever changed how we think about black holes. Until then, black holes were thought to be the ultimate cosmic vacuum cleaners, regions of space where everything, even light, gets swallowed without a trace. They were believed to be completely black, cold, and dead. But Hawking's insight revealed something astonishing black holes aren't just passive consumers of matter and energy. They actually emit radiation, which means they lose mass over time. This discovery, known as Hawking radiation, has profound implications for our understanding of both black holes and quantum mechanics. To understand how Hawking arrived at this groundbreaking discovery, we need to delve into the quantum world once again. The key idea comes from quantum field theory, which describes how fields such as the electromagnetic field interact with particles we have observed. Hawking radiation is emitted from black holes, gradually causing them to evaporate over extremely long periods of time. According to quantum field theory, the vacuum of space is not truly empty. Instead, it's filled with temporary particle-antiparticle pairs that constantly pop in and out of existence. These are called virtual particles because they exist only for a brief moment before annihilating each other and disappearing. This process, now known as Hawking radiation, shows that black holes can slowly evaporate over time. This idea turned the classical notion of black holes on its head Instead of being eternal, unchanging objects that only grow in size by consuming more matter, black holes could shrink and eventually disappear, losing mass through this radiation. But this also opened up a new can of worms for physicists, as it raised several deep and unresolved questions about the nature of black holes and the fundamental principles of physics. The fact that black holes can emit radiation and lose mass is counterintuitive. After all, black holes are known for pulling everything inward, not for radiating energy outward. So how does this work? The process can be understood using a concept from Einstein's theory of relativity. Mass and energy are equivalent E equals mc square. When the virtual particle pair is created near the event horizon, the black hole loses a tiny bit of its energy by pulling one of the particles inside. This loss of energy translates into a loss of mass for the black hole. Over time, as more and more particles are created and escape in the form of Hawking radiation, the black hole gradually shrinks. The amount of radiation emitted by a black hole is extremely small, especially for larger black holes like those found at the centers of galaxies. For example, a black hole with the mass of the sun would take longer than the current age of the universe to evaporate completely through Hawking radiation. However, for smaller black holes, known as primordial black holes, the process could be much faster. These smaller black holes, which may have formed in the early universe, could potentially evaporate in much shorter time frames, and their final moments would be marked by an intense burst of energy. One of the most surprising aspects of Hawking's discovery is that it connects black holes to thermodynamics, the branch of physics that deals with heat, energy, and entropy. In fact, the study of black holes has led to the development of a new field known as black hole thermodynamics which mirrors many of the laws of classical thermodynamics. The first law of black hole thermodynamics states that changes in the mass or energy of a black hole 
are related to changes in its surface area, rotation, and charge. In simpler terms, when a black hole consumes matter or radiates energy through Hawking radiation, its overall energy balance changes, just like how adding or removing heat from a system changes its internal energy. The second law of black hole thermodynamics mirrors the second law of classical thermodynamics, which says that entropy, a measure of disorder or randomness in an isolated system always increases. For black holes, the equivalent rule is that the surface area of the event horizon never decreases. As matter falls into a black hole, its surface area grows, which is a measure of its entropy. This means black holes are not just featureless objects, they have a well-defined thermodynamic property, namely entropy. But when Hawking radiation is taken into account, things get tricky. If black holes can lose mass and shrink through radiation, it suggests that their surface area could decrease over time. This raised an important question. Does this violate the second law of thermodynamics? Physicists have found that when you take into account the radiation emitted by the black hole, the total entropy of the black hole and the universe combined still increases, preserving the overall second law of thermodynamics. In 1971, Physicist John Wheeler introduced a thought experiment involving pouring a hot cup of tea into a black hole, which raised questions about whether black holes might violate the second law of thermodynamics. Another potential violation was suggested by Girac, who described a scenario where a box of matter, with a mass nearly zero as measured from far away, is lowered toward a black hole's horizon. As the box nears the horizon, it radiates away some of its mass, requiring less work to return to infinity. This process could transform heat into work, seemingly violating the second law of thermodynamics. These apparent violations, along with Hawking's area theorem, led Jacob Bekenstein to propose that black holes possess entropy proportional to the area of their event horizon measured in Planck units. This idea led to a revised version of the second law of thermodynamics, known as the generalized second law, which states that the total change in entropy, including both the entropy of matter and the entropy of black holes, cannot decrease. Bekenstein demonstrated that this new law addressed the issues raised by Girac's scenario and tested it in various contexts, such as with a harmonic oscillator inside a spherical box and infalling radiation. The third law of black hole thermodynamics states that it is impossible to reduce a system's entropy to absolute zero. For black holes, this means that it's impossible to reduce the surface area of a black hole to zero without completely evaporating it through Hawking radiation. These laws of black hole thermodynamics provide a profound connection between the seemingly separate fields of gravity, quantum mechanics, and thermodynamics, showing that black holes are much more than just mysterious cosmic objects. They are deeply intertwined with the fundamental laws of physics. One of the most important implications of Hawking's discovery is that black holes can eventually evaporate completely. As black holes lose mass over time through Hawking radiation, they shrink and radiate more intensely. The smaller the black hole becomes, the more rapidly it radiates, accelerating the evaporation process. Eventually, a black hole could shrink to a tiny point and disappear altogether in a final burst of radiation. This process is incredibly slow for large black holes. As mentioned earlier, a black hole with the mass of the sun would take longer than the age of the universe to evaporate. However, for smaller black holes, such as primordial black holes that could be as small as an asteroid, this evaporation could happen on a much shorter time scale, potentially even within the lifetime of the universe. The final stages of a black hole's evaporation would be the most dramatic. As the black hole shrinks, it radiates more and more energy 
releasing a burst of high-energy particles in its final moments. Some physicists predict that the death of a black hole would produce a powerful burst of gamma rays, which could be detectable by telescopes. However, so far, no such bursts have been observed, leading some to speculate that primordial black holes may not exist, or they evaporated long ago. While Hawking's discovery of black hole radiation was revolutionary, it also created a deep and troubling paradox for physicists. This is known as the black hole information paradox, and it arises from a fundamental conflict between general relativity and quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, information about the physical state of a system is always preserved. Even if a particle is destroyed or transformed, the underlying information about its state must still exist in some form. This principle is called unitarity, and it's one of the cornerstones of quantum mechanics. However, Hawking radiation seems to suggest that information could be lost forever. When matter falls into a black hole, all the information about the state of that matter, its position, velocity, composition, and so on, appears to be trapped inside the black hole. But if the black hole eventually evaporates completely through Hawking radiation, where does that information go? Does it disappear with the black hole? If the information is truly lost, it would violate the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, creating a major conflict between quantum theory and general relativity. This paradox has puzzled physicists for decades, and despite many proposed solutions, no one has definitively solved it. Over the years, physicists have proposed various ways to resolve the information paradox, but each solution comes with its own challenges. Some of the leading ideas include that the information about the matter that falls into a black hole is somehow encoded in the Hawking radiation itself. While this idea seems plausible, it's unclear how the information would be encoded in the radiation and no one has yet worked out a detailed theory explaining how this would work. Another intriguing solution comes from string theory and the idea of the holographic principle. This principle suggests that all the information about the matter inside a black hole could be stored on its surface, the event horizon, in much the same way that a 3D image can be encoded on a 2D surface like a hologram. According to this idea, the black hole's event horizon acts like a giant memory bank, storing all the information about the matter that falls into it. This correspondence suggests that a theory of quantum gravity in a black hole, the bulk, can be equivalent to a lower dimensional quantum field theory without gravity on its boundary. This deep connection between different dimensions offers a potential way to preserve information while still allowing black holes to evaporate. One more possibility is that black holes don't completely evaporate. Instead, they leave behind a small remnant, a sort of fossil of the black hole that contains all the information that was trapped inside. These remnants would be incredibly dense and small, but they could potentially store vast amounts of information. However, this idea faces challenges as well particularly when it comes to explaining how these remnants would form and what their properties would be. One of the more recent and controversial ideas is the concept of firewalls. According to this theory, the event horizon of a black hole could be surrounded by a wall of high energy particles that destroy any matter or information that tries to cross it. This would solve the information paradox by ensuring that information never actually falls into the black hole. It's destroyed at the event horizon. However, this idea challenges the traditional view of black holes and has sparked intense debate among physicists. Black holes are more than just objects that pull everything in with their gravity. They play a key role in understanding how quantum physics works, especially with quantum entanglement. This strange phenomenon links particles in such a way 
that when one changes, the other responds instantly, no matter how far apart they are. But what does this have to do with black holes? To figure this out, we need to see how black holes and entanglement connect to some of the biggest puzzles in physics. One of the biggest mysteries in physics is the black hole information paradox. In quantum mechanics, when two particles are entangled, they stay connected, no matter how far apart they are. What's interesting is that even if one particle falls into a black hole, the other particle still knows what happens to it. This has led scientists to believe that black holes may not destroy information entirely. Instead, the information could be encoded in some way on the event horizon, the boundary of the black hole. This theory, proposed by physicists Juan Maldacena and Leonard Susskind, suggests that quantum entanglement and wormholes, theoretical tunnels through space-time, are related. ER refers to Einstein-Rosen bridges, another name for wormholes, and EPR refers to Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen pairs, which are quantum entangled particles. The idea is that entangled particles might be connected through tiny wormholes. So, if one particle falls into a black hole, it could still be connected to the other particle outside the black hole. This theory suggests that black holes and quantum entanglement are linked in ways that we don't fully understand yet, but it could help explain how information might escape a black hole without being destroyed. In the classic view of a black hole, Anything that crosses the event horizon is lost forever. But quantum entanglement introduces the possibility that information might not be lost after all. This could mean that the information about the stuff that falls into a black hole is stored in a kind of quantum code on the event horizon. This code could be related to the holographic principle, a theory that says all the information inside a black hole could be represented as a two-dimensional surface on its event horizon. The holographic principle suggests that everything happening inside a black hole can be described by what's happening on its surface. This has huge implications for how we understand the universe. If information inside a black hole is stored on its surface, then the event horizon might act like a screen that shows what's inside, much like a hologram. Entanglement could be the mechanism that helps transfer this information back out into the universe in the form of Hawking radiation. Entanglement could also play a role in the structure of space-time itself. Some scientists think that space-time, the very fabric of the universe, might emerge from quantum entanglement. In this view, the geometry of space and time could be created by networks of entangled particles. This idea has gained traction in recent years, a theory in which a quantum system without gravity is related to a system with gravity in a higher dimension. If space-time itself is built from quantum entanglement, then black holes could be places where this connection is most intense. Inside black holes, space-time breaks down and singularities form. These singularities are points where the laws of physics as we know them, stop working. But if quantum entanglement is fundamental to space-time, then the behavior of entangled particles could offer clues about what happens in these extreme conditions. To sum up, quantum entanglement is an essential piece of the puzzle when it comes to understanding black holes. Through entanglement, particles can remain connected, even across the event horizon of a black hole. The ER equals EPR conjecture suggests that this connection might be more than just a spooky quantum phenomenon. It might involve wormholes and even the fundamental structure of space-time. Astronomers have made an incredible discovery that could help explain the mysterious dark energy that makes up most of the universe. According to recent findings, 
black holes could be the key to unlocking this mystery. Also, dark energy has long puzzled scientists as it has been inferred from observations of stars and galaxies, but its origins and nature remain largely unknown. However, this latest discovery provides a potential explanation for this enigmatic force. Only 5% of the universe is made up of the matter we know, while 27% is made up of dark matter, an elusive substance that doesn't interact with light. The rest of the universe, a whopping 68%, is composed of dark energy. In a recent scientific publication in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, researchers presented compelling evidence suggesting that black holes may be the origin of dark energy. Dark energy is a puzzling thing that makes space stretch and pushes the universe to expand faster. Scientists speculate it might be an unknown field or property of empty space. Now here looms a tantalizing question. How can black holes and dark energy be connected? According to quantum mechanics, empty space should have vacuum energy, which is believed to be present throughout the universe and resist gravity. This energy is a top contender for dark energy. In 1966, Soviet physicist Erast Gleiner proposed a theory based on Einstein's equations that giant balls of vacuum energy could appear as black holes to outside observers while actually having different properties. To understand this theory, Imagine two balls of the same size and mass, with one being a black hole and the other being a giant ball of vacuum energy. From a distance, both balls would appear to have the same gravitational pull and appear indistinguishable. However, upon closer inspection, their properties would be different. The black hole would have a singularity and an event horizon while the giant ball of vacuum energy would not have these features. Instead, it would be made up of vacuum energy, which exerts a force opposing gravity and plays a role in the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. This means that if these objects exist, dark energy is not spread out evenly in space. Instead, it is found only in certain areas, specifically inside black holes. Despite being limited to these locations, dark energy would still have an impact on the expansion of the universe. According to astrophysicist Duncan Farah from the University of Hawaii, Manoa, if supermassive black holes are indeed the source of dark energy, it would mean that they are connected to the constant stretching of space and that their mass should change as the universe expands. In other words, if the volume of the universe doubles, so does the mass of the black hole. The researchers compared black hole masses in galaxies where stars are still forming with black hole masses in dormant galaxies where no more stars are born. In young galaxies, black holes can grow by consuming nearby stars and other material. However, in older galaxies, there is not much material left for them to consume. Surprisingly, the scientists found that the black holes in dormant galaxies were much more massive than expected, indicating that there may be another way in which the black holes are growing. After analyzing the properties of ellipticals over roughly 9 billion years, Farah and his team made an interesting discovery. They found that black holes in the early universe were much smaller relative to their host galaxies than those in the modern universe. This suggests that the black holes had grown by a factor of 7 to 10 times in mass over time. They reported their findings in the Astrophysical Journal this month. If black holes grew by eating nearby gas and dust, many new stars should have formed far from them. But if black holes were made from dark energy, they would change in the same way the universe does. And that is what scientists found when they studied certain galaxies with big black holes. Black holes have an incredibly powerful gravitational force that even light cannot escape, causing everything to be drawn in. At the center of a black hole lies a singularity where matter is compressed to an infinitely dense point. However, 
Singularities are mathematical concepts and are not believed to be physically real. This theory also restricts the singularity concept. This theory is also not free from inquiries. And a frequent question being asked is that black holes only make up a small percentage of visible matter. As we are aware, visible matter accounts for only 5% of the entire universe, while dark energy makes up 68%. Hence, it is not possible for black holes alone to account for this significant amount. Furthermore, there are still many unanswered questions regarding the behavior of black holes, such as the information paradox, which raises the question of whether information can truly be lost in a black hole. The study of black holes is also hindered by the fact that they are incredibly difficult to observe directly, and much of our understanding of them is based on indirect observations. All of these properties of black holes, such as information paradox and less percentage of the visible matter, certainly put a question mark on this theory. But the scientists are thinking out of the box theories and the recent discovery that black holes could be the key to unlocking the mystery of dark energy has sparked a wave of excitement and fascination in the scientific community. The origins and nature of dark energy have long puzzled scientists, but this finding provides a potential explanation for this enigmatic force. The potential connection between black holes and dark energy offers a tantalizing possibility for transforming our understanding of the universe and the forces that shape it. With only 5% of the universe made up of the matter we know, and the rest composed of dark energy and dark matter, this discovery opens up a whole new realm of possibilities. By studying the behavior of black holes, Researchers have found evidence suggesting that they emit particles that could potentially create dark energy. This means that if black holes are indeed responsible for producing dark energy, it would mean that they are connected to the constant stretching of space and that their mass should change as the universe expands. Even with the challenges and mysteries that black holes present, their study is crucial to our understanding of the universe and the fundamental laws that govern it. As our technology and knowledge advance, we may be able to unlock even more secrets about these enigmatic cosmic phenomena. Despite some questions and inquiries about the theory, this discovery offers a groundbreaking insight into one of the greatest mysteries of the universe. The potential implications of this finding are enormous, and it could pave the way for a whole new era of scientific discovery and understanding. The study of black holes and quantum phenomena is a field that is still evolving. By combining classical ideas of gravity with the rules of quantum mechanics, physicists hope to unlock new insights into how the universe works on the smallest scales. Whether through black hole analogs in the lab, exotic black hole types, or new theories of quantum gravity, we are slowly piecing together the puzzle of black holes and their quantum worlds. This concludes our video. We hope you enjoyed the content and found it informative. If you did, please consider subscribing. It's free for you, but helps support our channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.